Hello, my name is Achal Mehra and welcome to the Leadership Chat, a series by IIT Gandhinagar's Leadership Development Initiative under which we bring prominent leaders from diverse fields to share their experiences and thoughts on leadership with our students. In today's chat, we are pleased to host Muktesh Pant, former Global Chief Marketing Officer of Reebok, which won two Golden Lion Awards at the Cannes Festival during his tenure. He has also served as worldwide CEO of KFC, president of Taco Bell, and most recently as CEO of Yum China, one of the world's largest restaurant chains with 10,000 restaurants and half a million employees. Currently, Mickey is a senior advisor at Beyond Meat, which offers plant-based meat substitutes. Thank you, Mickey, for joining us on today's leadership chat. Let me start first with a brief career journey and start with the point at which I graduated from IIT Kanpur in 1976 with a degree in chemical engineering. In those days, it used to be a five-year program. And I guess you will all be in that same situation. And the very first decision that I had to make was whether to start working or whether to do an MBA. And I was fortunate in those days, I guess it was easier. I had been admitted to IIM at Ahmedabad. But I also had a very tempting offer of being a management trainee with Hindustan Legal Limited. At that time, the premier multinational, I guess, still amongst the top employers in the country. And the tempting part was that they were willing to take me into marketing, which is something that I really wanted. And uh, the recruitment and training manager at the time was R.R. R. Nair at Hindustan Lieber. And he was on campus actually in Kanpur. And uh, he made some uh, two very convincing arguments for joining the company directly instead of doing an MBA. And he said, the first is that um, instead of paying IIM Ahmedabad your fees, you'll be paid by Hindustan Lieber, so you start earning a salary. And secondly, you save two years because we can teach you all that there is to know about marketing in a much more effective way than you can do in a classroom. So I was young and impressionable, and I'm actually quite glad that I did make that decision. So I, I started working directly for my IDK. And uh, within a few weeks of graduation, I was uh, working in marketing. I was actually training as a salesman uh, in Amritsar territory, pushing a handcart full of soap and trying to sell it to retailers. And uh, I spent 15 years in Hindustan Lieber, uh, some of the best years of my life. And one of the things that I would leave with you is that if you get to join a good company, a company that is renowned for training, you should grab it with both hands because that is the most important thing that you can have in your career. So I worked in all divisions of Hindustan Lieber, initially in personal care. And then I was in the international trade division for quite a while. I lived in London for a while. I was traveling across in those days, in the early 80s, what was communist Eastern Europe uh, and also parts of Western Europe and developing a perspective for international business. And then I worked later in the food business in, 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 at, at Brook Bond, which had just been acquired by the company. And after 15 years, I was made a very tempting offer by PepsiCo, which is just starting up. And the former IIT alumnus actually, Ramesh Bangal was running uh, you know, just start, the startup. So I was amongst the early employees in India. And I spent some great uh, years there. Uh, and then I got an offer that I could not refuse. I think Achal referred to the fact that I was fond of running uh, recreationally in those days. Uh, but I was approached by Reebok International. And this was in the early 90s when they were on a tear. And they were really very high market share and, and doing very well indeed. And, and I spent 10 wonderful years at Reebok. Uh, about half of that as the global chief marketing officer. By that time, I had moved to the US. I was living in Boston. And uh, in terms of career, one of my highlights in 2002, um, as you, some of you may know, there is a seminal sporting event in the United States called the Super Bowl, which is the uh, conference championship between the 30 odd teams that play in the National Football League. And in the Super Bowl, uh, the advertising rates are very high because it's got the highest viewership in the United States. And uh, I was the chief marketing officer and with my good friend, Peter Arnell, who was, um, we still are very close friends, we, create, we worked out a 60 second TV commercial, which in those days took four and a half million dollars to air for just one airing for 60 seconds. It was quite a career risk, uh, but in the event it became very successful. And if you're in the world of marketing, at least in the United States, to have a successful Super Bowl commercial is highly noticed. And uh, you can Google it. It was called Terry Tate, T-E-R-R-Y, and then T-A-T-E, Terry Tate. And it became a cult favorite. In fact, I'm surprised that even now, 20 years later, it is routinely mentioned in the top 10 TV commercials of all time in the Super Bowl. 
and some of the surveys even put it at number one. So that got uh, me uh, a very, uh, it was probably my career highlight uh, in the world of marketing. You know, I was at Cannes uh, at the International Film Festival receiving the Golden Lion. And then uh, I was invited to the New York Stock Exchange to ring the closing bell along with the athlete who had done the uh, commercial. And um, that led me to um, uh, then work for Yum, Interna uh, Yum Brands, uh, which was the world's largest restaurant company. Uh, today it has more than 50,000 restaurants. Uh, and then I spent another 15 years uh, of my career at Yum Brands, a great, great company indeed. Uh, used to be part of PepsiCo originally. Um, and uh, as Achal mentioned, I did a number of roles there, including running the international business. And then I got a very exciting career break in 2015. I was uh, invited to go to China. Uh, the Yum business in China is gigantic. It's 10,000 restaurants, it employs half a million people. And uh, it's, a, it's, well, it's a signature business in China, amongst all businesses. And I got the opportunity because uh, Yum was one of the most far-sighted companies in the early days had spotted that China was going to be in perhaps the world's largest economy and also was going to become relatively independent from the rest of the world. So I was given the task of carving it out and spinning it off as a separate company. And that was successfully done on um, November 1, 2016, when we um, did um, uh, you know, a public issue in the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, once again, I was uh, there for the opening bell of the New York Stock Exchange, the slam ringing it from Shanghai late at night. And the stock began to trade. And today the company is valued at over $20 billion. And I stayed with that company for a while. I was the vice chairman of the board and a senior advisor afterwards. And then eventually I detached myself from there. And uh, currently I advise companies. And as I shall mention, one of my favorites of all time, and I'm in seventh heaven actually working for that company, is called Beyond Meat. I think one day it'll be very relevant for India. Uh, Beyond Meat is started by Ethan Brown, a brilliant entrepreneur in California. And he has uh, assembled a team of molecular biologists and chemists and uh, just some outstanding um, technical people. And uh, together they have created a technology by which they can manufacture uh, what is effectively meat, but with no animals involved whatsoever. So it's a very humane process. It's great for the environment. Uh, they produce uh, every kind of meat, chicken, beef, pork. It's become a huge seller in the US. And if you follow the press, uh, about a week ago, we announced that we will be building a very large factory in Asia uh, to be able to service the demand there. So uh, my journey in marketing continues and I'm uh, fascinated by the field. Uh, I just thought before we turn it over to questions, I might give you a, a few tips on what I've learned. Because uh, as you can imagine, without an MBA, I was a bit of an illiterate in the world of corporate uh, management. So I do not have much uh, jargon or background in that regard, except what I picked up over the years. But I did pick up some, um, some thoughts and I thought for people, particularly from IIT, this might be relevant. So it takes a number of skills to be successful in a corporate career. And uh, I want to highlight four or five of them. And two of them you have in plentiful measure. And those two are very important. And they played a critical role in my career, even though I did not do engineering in my career. But uh, they played a very important role. And those two are planning and analysis. Planning and analysis. As you can imagine, these are important in any company. The aspect of planning refers to basically time series, you know, whether it's a, your own calendar, uh, how you plan that. And as you grow up and get married and have children and have friends, trust me, the demands on your time are going to be enormous. And uh, whether you're a low level executive or a chairman or whether you're the richest man in the world or anybody at all, remember the one thing that everybody has is just 24 hours in the day. And that is the most inelastic resource in the world. And planning that well is a very critical aspect. And the, the second one uh, on, on the issue of time series of planning is planning for goal setting. How do you set goals for your organization? How do you make them inspiring? For how long do you set them? How do you involve different parts of your organization in the process, uh, et cetera? And then there are many aspects of planning as you can imagine. As far as analysis is concerned, you are very good at that already because you are always solving problems and just to get into IIT, you must have been really good at analysis. So uh, analysis typically uh, is where you take a concept and you convert it into numbers. 
and then uh, you you play with the numbers and then you convert it back to the concept and you get a good result right that's what most of engineering is and uh, in in business there are there are a lot of um, situations where you need analytical skill and trust me you will be very good at that i had that same experience also having had the basic training that you have but before i move on from planning and analysis although you are very skilled at that i just leave you with a couple of tips on the aspect of planning, and this came to me actually quite late in my career, maybe in the last 10 years, keep your calendars as light as possible. You know, I had uh, developed a discipline where, um, you know, I would ask my assistant, uh, and she was really good, to print out a one-year calendar, you know, on Outlook, you can do that. And I used to tell her all the meetings I put in red, and all the empty space where I have no meetings, put it in green and then just put it on the table and lay it out. And if there was a lot of red, I used to tell her to somehow get rid of it. Uh, you know, tell her like, hey, June looks terrible. It's not manageable, so I need more time. And you can do it quite easily, actually, because you can cut the length of meetings. You know, we have this great um, uh, thought it's in, in, in Yum Brands, and we used it a lot as a tool. It was called the Jeep Bonnet Review. Jeep bonnet review. A Jeep is the vehicle you drive in the army, right? Uh, all of you have probably been in a Jeep. Uh, a bonnet is really the, the hood and a review is a review. And the term came from the war, the, the Korean War and the Vietnamese War, when American uh, commanders used to have soldiers and they used to have a task for the day. You know, you could not leave the battlefield, obviously. So you had to make a quick decision. Uh, at the same time, you needed consensus and you needed the information. So what they used to do is that on the bonnet of the Jeep, they would open a map and everybody would look at it and take the decision in five minutes because there were shells bursting around you. You couldn't hang around for too long. And we used to call these meetings Jeep bonnet reviews. Instead of a one hour meeting, why can't we meet for five minutes and take the decision? I would encourage you to do that. It's a very effective way of working. Also gives you plenty of time on the calendar because the life that you will lead will be unpredictable. You know, your competitors, uh, the environment, you know, God knows now with COVID, things happen in the world that cannot be planned. And if you're stuck with a calendar, firstly, it's a pain in the neck to work for anybody who's got a very full calendar. And secondly, you won't find the time to be able to really solve problems. On the aspect of analysis, also a quick comment is that never do analysis sitting at a desk. It's okay in engineering, you've got your work desk and you've got a problem and you've got your, you know, your tools and you analyze problems. But in real life, you should do the analysis where the action is. So I learned this early on in Hindustan Lever, is always go to the stores, go to the shops, talk to the Kirana shop, talk to the owner, find out what's going on. In five minutes, you find out a lot more than you can sitting at your desk. And that discipline continued when I was uh, running international in Yum Brands, uh, over a hundred countries with uh, you know, KFC and Pizza Hut and Taco Bell restaurants. And I think I visited more than 60 of those. And when we went to a market with a team, we normally would take the country manager and their team and go straight to a restaurant, sit in the restaurant. You see the menu panel, you see consumers, you can talk to the staff, you go to the kitchen, you ask the worker, what time did you start your day today? And then you get a much better sense. You can still do all your analysis, but it's based in reality. Now planning and analysis you will have in spades, as I said, you will not have a problem there. The third skill that is critical is communication. And uh, that, unfortunately, there is not enough formal training on. Perhaps for good reason, I don't think you can really teach it. It has to be observed. And uh, it can make all the difference between success and failure is how you communicate, because it's the only connection that you've got with the people who you're working with. And uh, the one speech that I'm always fascinated by, and I was watching recently, 1977, when the Indira Gandhi government lost after the uh, emergency was lifted, uh, and the Janata Party came on a rule, which was a surprise. I remember those very well. I just graduated. I was working in, in HLL. And uh, there was a series of speeches by a number of leaders at the time, you know, Chandrasekhar and Jagjivan Ram and Muraji Desai, et cetera, in Delhi. And you can see it on Google. It's in black and white, but it's fascinating to watch. The person you should try and listen to is uh, the greatest orator I think India has produced, which is Atal Bihari Bajpayee. And if you listen to his speech, you'll be astonished that he says pretty much what everybody else is saying, which is criticizing the emergency and talking about the days that are to come. But the way he said it, his choice of words, you know, the pauses that he introduces, the start, the body of it, 
And the obvious rapport whether he has with the audience where you can tell that they are responding to what he's saying is a joy to watch. People like that are rare. I don't think we can ever uh, hope to be at their level, but we can learn a lot. So I would encourage you dramatically uh, to follow this, that when you listen to a good piece of communication, whether in a movie or on a, in real life, try to figure out what it is that the person is doing that is working and pick that up. That's crucially important. The fourth skill is innovation. And uh, this, uh, when you distill it down, you can spend a week on this topic, but when you distill it down, it comes to courage. Because you take the great innovators, whether it's Steve Jobs or it's, uh, you know, Elon Musk today, or it was at the time Dhirubhai Ambani in India or his son Mukesh Ambani. These are great innovators. And uh, the thing about innovators is that when they start their innovation, the whole world tells them that they're wrong and that it will fail. And, and they go through a very dis difficult experience. Um, uh, this you can never uh, be taught really, it's a personality characteristic, whether you're risk averse or not. But you can surround yourself with people and you can certainly create the circumstances where innovation happens. Because if you're in an organization that is innovative, you'll be much more successful than otherwise. And that's an aspect that again is not really taught and you'll have to learn that. I don't think you can even learn that in, in an MBA. You will have to learn that on your own. But if you can just make a mental note that that is important. And the last one that I'll talk about and then I'll pause and we can get into questions and answers is training, training. Remember, if you do your job really well in a company, you get paid very well. You will get a bonus, you will be rewarded, but you may not get promoted. The way to get promoted is not by doing your job very well. The way to get promoted is to do your job very well and provide evidence that you can do the next job. And that invariably refers to working with other people, especially people who are working for you. So remember, if you have one person working for you, then you can tell them what to do. If you have two people working for you, maybe you can tell them what to do and it might work. But if you have three people working for you, you can forget telling them because no person is as good as three people. You may be better than one, you may be better than two, but nobody in this world is better than three people put together. And at that stage, what you have to do is to train them with all that you know and let them figure it out. And so training is a critical aspect. And if you can pick that skill up initially, you will be trained as you work, but later how to become a good trainer then you can be extraordinarily successful in your life. So with that, Achal, I'm coming right on 20 minutes and I'll pause at this stage and we can talk and have questions or whatever way you want to do it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mickey. Uh, yeah, so I'll get into some questions and I'll try to weave some of the audience questions as well because we had had some people submit questions in advance also into this. Now you have touched briefly on this already, but since our audience is uh, IIT students who have been through your experience, let me force the, uh, pose the first question from one of our students, Harsh Patel, uh, who has asked, uh, because you also shifted from engineering to marketing and branding in a sense, that what in your IIT education, educational experience, which may include, I guess, both the curriculum as well as outside the curriculum, has proven of value to you in your professional work? Well, Harsh, I mean, I think I referred to some of it. So the, uh, what are traditionally called the left brain skills, which is uh, those of rational thinking, planning, analysis, working things out. I think those will do you very, very well. In fact, uh, I found that in marketing, I was at a bit of an advantage because, uh, you know, people generally in marketing slip into jargon and slip into, you know, like emotional discussions, whereas actually it is pretty rational. You know, you have to calculate how many people will buy your product, how frequently they will buy it, what price they're willing to pay, and all of these call for skills that are analytical. And you will find a tremendous benefit from your IIT education in those aspects. So you can rest assured that your IIT education, irrespective of what field you're working in, will provide, will be invaluable and it'll come back to you later. The one aspect I would mention, and I did discuss this briefly with Achal when we had a prep talk about this call about a week ago, is that in our case, in, in, when, when I was in IIT, our big advantage was that we had five years there and we used to have a lot of humanities programs and they were equally, they were equally weighted. You know, you did a course in economics or psychology, it had the same weight as whether you were doing uh, advanced engineering maths or you were doing fluid mechanics, it was the same weightage. 
And uh, when we look back, and my friends who are now, all of us are getting on in age, <laughs> we get together and talk about IIT. Those were the best courses that I think we ran. And, and this even is true for people who are working in engineering fields, pure engineers. I remember Professor Usha Kumar, uh, Achal might remember her. She was a, science, a teacher of psychology, a phenomenal person. We learned basic concepts there about defense mechanisms and about the way people behave and about uh, you know, psychological disturbances. And all of us do go through stresses and strains and those were terribly important. We learned economics, we learned symbolic logic. You know, we even learned art. It was a great course we ran in European art. Those help you make conversations, you know, they can make you better informed. So I guess uh, you know, pay attention if you have those humanities courses, just hang on to them with both hands, thanks. Uh, yeah, well, uh, thanks for that. I can tell you that uh, oftentimes many IIT students recoil from humanities courses uh, <laughs> during that period. So thanks for that plug right now. Can you speak also during this IIT experience outside uh, uh, you know, the coursework to uh, whatever extracurricular engagements that you had and uh, how those might have helped uh, and that students should also use that as learnings for later in life? Well, I wish I had done more, Achal, as all I can say. So for those of you who are about to graduate, you've already been through the experience. But those of you who are relatively early on in IIT, I don't know what the makeup of the audience is, but if some of you are in your first or second year, or even in a third year, uh, whatever extracurricular activities on campus are available, do sign up for them and get involved. You know, when I look back in IIT, we had an airstrip. We, we could take gliding lessons. We had a television center where you could learn the basics of production. There used to be every kind of society debating dramatics, elocution, sport. And uh, frankly, I did not do enough. I wish I had done a lot more. And uh, the few things that I did do with regards to publishing and the college magazine, et cetera, were very rewarding. But uh, as I said, you know, life is not, uh, life is very different from the classroom. And uh, it consists of many elements that are not strictly related to your immediate focus so just try to have as wide a perspective as you can besides that it's a lot more fun that way so okay so let me touch a little on some of your professional uh, background and you know advice that you can draw from that uh, so you were the chief marketing officer for Reebok and we have seen a trend of brands in the case of Reebok I guess in athletics uh, using sponsors or ambassadors who are not sports people uh, who are celebrities or cultural ambassadors of various kinds. Can you talk about the factors one considers in the selection of a brand ambassador and perhaps not uh, identify for us, not just ones that have been successful because, uh, you know, I, I guess we know about them, but also ones that failed and uh, as ambassadors or weren't as effective as ambassadors and what some of the reasons for that can be. Well, I think it should make sense and uh, the ambassador should have a credible direct benefit from the brand. I think just to endorse something and uh, you know, be paid money for it normally is not great. You can get awareness that way, but not really credibility or brand support. So in the sporting goods industry, obviously athletes play a critical role. When we started Reebok in India, I remember working very closely and became friends with, you know, at the time, Mohammed Azaruddin and, uh, you know, Rahul Dravid. And uh, I even took one time I took, uh, uh, Jadeja with me to IIM Ahmedabad to conduct interviews to select students and we you know we flew together and had a great time and you know Anil Kumble and Srinath and all these great people at the time were uh, you know are and I learned a lot from them because they lead a very difficult life and the way they train and particularly the cricket shoes because that time cricket shoes were not available and we developed special cleated cricket shoes especially for fast bowlers uh, was very important so if you can get that match of course it's great but it is true today that lifestyle goes beyond sport. So at Reebok, for example, we did a deal with the great rap artist, Jay-Z. And uh, you know, we could not be more different, me and Jay-Z. <laughs> I could not even understand what he was saying. He could definitely not understand what I was saying, but we, we, we had a good relationship and we signed a contract and we produced a range of shoes for him, which were very, very popular. And then we signed up Shakira, the great Colombian uh, artist. And I remember going to a number of her concerts and I became very popular because I used to have tickets to her concerts. <laughs> but uh, she was great. She developed a, a classic shoe for us, which did very well. But I must say that, you know, in general, you should try for your brand ambassador to find a good, real fit. You know, not just a famous film star because you get the credibility. Yeah. I was speaking to a US political consultant once and he said that the focus of political campaigns 
is less on persuading new people and more on exciting their political base and the already converted to actually go out and vote. Now that came as a surprise to me as we assume that political messaging is about convincing the undecided. Can you share a few commonly held marketing or branding myths that might surprise us? Uh, you know, this Achal is a great, great question. It gets to the heart of life actually because it's such a deep philosophical question and I developed a perspective on this which I hold very dearly and I still encourage people although I must say a lot of people don't uh, agree with me you know you are taught right from the time you start a marketing career that marketing is all about consumers that you must listen to the consumer now obviously marketing is about consumers because consumers eventually buy your product and pay you the money so I understand that part of it but marketing is not about what consumers want Marketing is about doing something that you can do better than anybody else in the world. That's what, that's what makes you successful. In fact, people who start chasing uh, trends uh, generally fail because they will try to copy what competitors are doing. Uh, the great, great marketeers, I think Steve Jobs was probably the greatest. He was a minimalist. He insisted there should not be a keyboard on the Apple iPhone. Now, if you do any research on the iPhone in the early days, the Blackberry used to win because it had a keyboard. He didn't like it. And uh, if he had listened to the research, he would have stuck in a keyboard. Brand would not have been what it is today. So he did what his conviction was. And the same strand of thought fits into political commentary even today and in the brands as well. And I always used to tell my marketing people, don't chase after new consumers. Just make sure that your existing consumers are coming back because they are loyal and they are already with you. And if you lose them, then you will not have no chance of getting somebody else. So I think your best probability of getting new people to join your brand is if you take care of your existing customers extraordinarily well. In fact, we had a saying in the restaurant industry that don't build a new restaurant. Just make sure that people who are coming to your restaurant are very satisfied and they will force you to build a new restaurant because they're so happy. They will want one closer to where they live. So it's the same thing in political philosophy now, Achal. I think companies are going to their base. Um, they're going to people who believe in the cause, who are loyal to them. And uh, it's, a, it's a very good formula for success. And I think if you take care of your base and you deliver real benefits, then the others will join as well. Now, you've had extensive experience working in India, US and China, and I guess uh, also with some of the global companies that are across other uh, countries as well. What are the significant distinctions in your work experience that you have seen in both the work and the leadership styles in, in these countries? Well, you know, there is the, what's broadly called the Western world, which is all the English speaking countries, United States, UK, Australia, Canada, they're very similar, very, very similar. I guess they come from a similar background. It's a very similar uh, approach to life. I think what is very different is um, countries in Asia. India is very different. Uh, China is extremely different. And so are every one of them, Japan, very different signatures. Uh, their styles are very different. In, in the United States, the emphasis is on individuality. You know, they insist that you must have the right to possess a gun. It's not because they're violent, it's because that's written in their constitution as a symbol of the fact that the individual is greater than the state. It's a very deeply held belief and in fact is the core of the Republican Party today. You may disagree with it, but it is a part of the American psyche. China is the exact opposite. From the time of Confucius, Chinese have been taught respect for the emperor respect for the emperor, which translates to respect for authority. When I went to China, I was astonished. I know it's very different. The first few days when I was in the boardroom and we had our leadership team and, uh, you know, I used to ask them, so what should we do? If there was a typical problem, what should we do? And uh, a number of them came to me very politely afterwards and said, hey, this is a little strange. You know, please don't ask us what to do because we expect as the leader, you should tell us what to do and then we'll do it. We're not used to this. You know, it'll create chaos in the company. And there is some truth to that. If you go to China and you have people working for you and you're clear on what you want, they will deliver. They're very happy with that. They don't like the ambiguity of having to make a decision. It's, it's, it's centuries of culture and then decades of training under the, under the system in which they live. Uh, India is very different. India is a blend of the two. It's individualistic. People don't listen very easily, but they are brilliant. And that's, I think, the reason why when I graduated Achal, there were no international companies run by Indians. In fact, most of the multinationals in India were run by foreigners. 
It then came to a stage where the multinationals were run by Indians. Today, we have a stage where a number of significant companies, including Microsoft and Google and Adobe, are run by Indians. By the time the people who are listening to this lecture graduate and then develop their careers 20 years from now, it might well be that a majority of uh, corporations are led by Indians. And I think the reason is that India is a blend of those two. It has respect for authority and tradition, but it also has a very, very strong strength of individuals. So let us turn to ethics and leadership for a moment. Uh, are there inherent tensions between them in the outcome-driven corporate culture and even the rat race, if you will, of uh, in, in the corporate sector? Have you had to struggle sometimes between balancing uh, ethical challenges? Well, personally, not really. I think, you know, I've become a big fan of uh, multinational companies. And, um, you know, many of my friends and my sisters sometimes think that I've become, uh, you know, a convert and why, why you know, they, many of them still think of them as, as kind of uh, profit making machines that are not intrinsically evil, but certainly they have a motive and they're driven and they're not really uh, socially conscious. So my experience is the opposite. I found that, uh, for example, I worked at Hindustan Labor 15 years and that company, I've been, my best friends are still there, and, or at least you know, my best friends have worked there. And uh, it's an extraordinarily ethical company. You know, within a week of joining, we used to have a legendary chairman at the time, his name was T. Thomas, and he used to run a program called my, Our Business and the Environment, and everybody had to attend it. In the first week as a management trainee or the first month, I was there at the training center in Bombay at Kulita and listening. And he said something which has stuck with me even today. And he said that if you are ever asked to give a bribe, you should resign. You should resign, it's the only way. And the company was puritanical about it. And uh, I've followed the same thing. So one of the aspects of ethics and laws for that matter are that they vary across cultures, right? So how do you reconcile, I guess, uh, uh, you know, if you're operating in countries which have different expectations and standards in these areas, uh, the, uh, you know, in Africa or India uh, for a multinational company? You still try to work within uh, local practices? I think there's a difference between laws and practices and customs. You know, the, the laws are very clear, I think, in every country. No country accepts bribery or corruption. <laughs> now, some countries are very corrupt, uh, no doubt about it. And I think we can all name three or four. But uh, the laws in those countries do not allow it. So they're breaking the law when they're doing that. So I think if people follow the law, you're basically in a very good space and companies must follow the law. So that's a very clear directive and I think that's very effective as well. As far as customs and practices are concerned, there are several. There are many countries where um, gift giving during festivals or during a cultural event is very common. And you have to find a practical solution. So like I said before, a simple symbol of the company, like a pen or a calendar or a diary or a very simple expression of something that is inexpensive, clearly described in the rules and laid out and told to all individuals about how to do it is a good way to do it. And um, you, know, you can achieve it, absolutely. But I think people get that uh, achal very easily. If you tell your people from the very first day that you are uh, going to be reputed for your honesty as a company, they get it. Most you know, people will understand. I see that you're a golfer and a marathon runner. Uh, I'm going to alienate a lot of people in this audience by saying that golf is not a sport in my book, but, but let's drop that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the marathon bit does impress me. Uh, and you have participated in the London and the New York marathons as well. Uh, talk about how you got into marathons and what does it do for you? Well, I used to run recreationally, you know, after IIT, you know, all of us, when you start working, I think you will all find this, you know, you're generally eating more. Once you get married, you're eating even more <laughs> and you put on weight. So I was doing it really for recreational purposes and I was enjoying it. And there was a big boom of running in the 80s and you know Bob Glover and people like that led the movement and we all read about it. And I, you know, I read initially that you know you must run 20 minutes without stopping and I started doing that and then gradually kept increasing. But when I worked for Reebok I was interacting with all these athletes and I don't know exactly how the idea came Achal but it was a challenge to say hey why can't I run a marathon. So I started training in Boston. London Marathon is in April so it's it's tough because you have to train for at least six months and that means you're training in the winter. You know, Boston Marathon <laughs> winters are very cruel. So September to February, you're running in the snow. I prepared for it in 2001 and went to London and ran it. And um, it was great. I enjoyed it. 
and then but it takes a toll you know it, it it's difficult to do 42 kilometers and you know you can get injuries um and then i repeated that in london 2007 because i felt i should and then i made a pledge to myself that if when i turn 60 i will run one and then sure enough in <laughs> 2014 when i did uh, i got the chance uh, lucky to be able to get into the new york city marathon i was raising money for the world food program and i was able to raise i think at that time thirty-five thousand dollars from friends and sponsors in order to be able to make a run and it was i was very uh, proud that it was sponsored by tcs so i still have my data consultancy services uh, medal and certificate in 2014 for the new york marathon I, well, I would encourage you to whatever you do i think achal is right golf is not really a uh, a strenuous sport, but it's a great sport. Um, but if you can develop something which keeps your cardiovascular activity up, you know, 20 minutes for three or four times a week, uh, tennis, I'm told, is the best in the world. Uh, you know, anecdotally, um, my tennis playing friends are, seem to be the fittest and uh, they seem to have the longest lives. So take something up and if you can, you can have fun doing it, it becomes a very good distraction from the stresses of corporate life as well. Okay, let's turn to some audience questions. The first one here we have is from Rahul Patel, uh, who's one of our students. Uh, uh, and his question is, achieving a goal with your team requires continuous grilling, and we face demotivation when we don't make progress. A uh, leader's job is to boost the team's morale. Uh, being a leader in the front, it is very important for a leader to be self-motivated. So uh, what are some of the day-to-day -day habits that can help a leader to become self-motivated, especially when the going gets tough? I think it's a personality characteristic, I'm guessing, uh, because, uh, you know, the fact that you are in IIT shows that you're very motivated. You know, very few people make it to IIT. And the reason is that the JEE is difficult to crack. And I, intellectual level is one thing, but just the rigor and discipline of competing. And then I'm sure when you get in, you know, normally I had the same experience. I was first in my school in high school, but when I got into IIT, I was suddenly <laughs> thrown off my balance because everybody was brilliant. And I was really not, uh, you know, I was struggling, in fact, in my first year and first uh, three semesters. And uh, uh, that struggle will teach you to do things in a way that keeps you on top. So I think a lot of motivation is self-driven. It's a personality characteristic. Uh, and I hope you have it. Uh, one of the things that can come in the way, you heard the mention of grilling. It's true that uh, you face stress. Uh, and uh, stress is something that takes a big toll on your health. A lot of people break down because of stress. I've seen it in the corporate world. And a number of people say, this is not the life for me. And they'll step aside or they retire early. But uh, if managed properly, uh it's a very productive thing in fact if you completely retire uh, my, the reason i did not completely retire is that when i look at my friends who completely retired they age very rapidly it's physically visible within two years their a whole persona their face the body everything looks retired and they look older and the reason is that uh, you don't have that minimal level of adrenaline that is needed to keep you going you know activity action is an is a necessary part of life so uh, i think a lot of the motivation is self-driven uh, as i said right at the beginning if you can work for a good company you will find yourself motivated because you'll be making good products and um and uh, good luck with that um, we have uh, people in the audience that are outside iit uh, as well and so we have this question here from harilal from iit bombay uh, who's asking the uh, how are the current trends in leadership changing with the changing times and let me add to that uh, has your leadership style evolved over time and the different geographies i guess that you have uh, worked in you know what is changing in leadership is that uh, i don't want to be sounding bitter or anything like that but this world was run the corporate world at least was run basically by um, a certain kind of people. They were male, 99% of leaders used to be men. And uh, they were generally from uh, uh, the US, Canada, United, uh, UK, Australia, those countries. And um, 
it was understandable. In my time in Hindustan Lever, when I joined the senior most executives, the directors of Unilever used to be all either from the UK or from Holland. Uh, and the breakthroughs came when, you know, people like Thomas and then later Dr. Ganguly and then and many others became members of the board of directors of Unilever. That, changed. that trend is continuing. So board rooms are getting more diverse. One of my greatest career achievements in China when I left was to appoint a, a lady, uh, Joey Watt, as the chief executive officer. Uh, and she runs one of China's biggest companies now. And I'm delighted and beyond me as well, we've hired a lady to run the operations in China. And uh, so you'll find a lot more gender balance. You'll find a lot more diversity in looks. You'll feel a lot more people with black hair and uh, looking like you and me uh, than used to be in the old days. And initially it was only in technology companies because in technology you have to solve problems and there is no, you know, the color of your skin does not help you. But it is now rapidly becoming in other companies. You know, great example is Pepsi-Cola. I mean, Indra Nui was a woman and she was from India. She was one of the most successful chairmen that they had, and she's a brilliant lady and did fantastically well. That would have been unthinkable. So I think the trend towards diversity, different points of view, um, and with it, it brings a whole different kind of cultural thinking is what's changing boards and, and companies today. Uh, because that is the profile of their customers and of the most of their managers, so it may as well be at the top as well. The second part of the question about whether you can uh, evolve your style, I'm sure, I'm sure all of us evolve our style as we go along. Some of it was early on, especially when I came to the US first, I was told that I have the habit of interrupting everybody. And thank God I got that feedback. I never realized it because in India, if you listen to Republic TV, you know exactly what he's saying. People talk at the same time and that's not done in many countries, certainly not in boardrooms. So you wait your turn. It's a very difficult thing because you're itching to say something. And I learned that. I learned that. I learned to take my place and to be respectful and to make the same points without being rude or aggressive. And um, so, yeah, those aspects do change. But I guess at the core, when I talk to my friends who were, uh, you know, at IIT together, we've all stayed pretty much the way we were. So. Uh, here's a question from uh, Jayati Pramlani, who's also an IIT student. Uh, leading people you know is easier, but people you don't know, uh, like what they are capable of, what their nature is, what their style of working is, etc. How would you lead such a team? What conversations would you like to have with them? Uh, would you try to develop personal relationships or keep it very professional? Yeah, it's a good question, Jayati. I I'm not sure about the premise, actually. Sometimes people you know are <laughs> more difficult to lead. Uh, you know, just like they say that, uh, you know, make a friend out of your uh, business partner, but never make a business partner out of a friend. It always breaks down. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you know people, it can be a bit of a disability because there's so much emotion, emotion involved in the relationship other than just the knowledge. But you are right that getting to know people is a critical part. And I think that all of us have had this experience in corporate life and probably you will have it too, is that the time that you spend outside of work is very important. So you must make time to have dinners together. You must with your teams, you know, take uh, offsites are very important. We used to do that beyond a certain level with spouses, like even at the board of Young China once a year, we would gather with a spouse, with spouses, and we would include the spouses in some of the sessions so that uh, you know, um, they could also see what their significant other did in real life. And they got a great deal of satisfaction from that. Plus, you've got to know them as people. You know, when you have dinner with somebody, even their choice of food or the way they talk to people can tell you a lot more than you can figure out in just a work environment. So, uh, yeah, you've got to know people a lot more. I guess my repeated strain in all of this is that um, life is much bigger than your immediate task at hand. And the more you're looking out with the telescope, you'll be better rather than looking with a microscope into the fine details. So try to keep a broad mind, whether it's humanities topics, extracurricular activities, outside of work interactions, being outside of the office, being on the front line. That is the way to you know, develop those antennae and technic tentacles and you can have good relations that way. So. Question from Neva Elna Vargas here. Uh, there are multiple leadership styles out there. So how does one choose one's leadership style? I think your leadership style chooses you. <laughs> you know? 
you don't choose a leadership style. You've got a certain, whether you call it karma or asana or whatever it is, you have a certain makeup, you know? We cannot change that intrinsically. You're either patient or short-tempered, you're either humorous or serious, you're either introverted or extroverted. A lot of those characteristics are deep within your DNA. You, I don't think those will change. So your leadership style should be something that naturally fits you. And the one thing I will encourage you by saying is that I have seen a lot of leaders in my time and I don't think that any two are alike. I've seen some tremendously introverted people who are great leaders. I've seen some very extroverted people who are great leaders and vice versa. So uh, choose your strength. And it's just like your relationships. I don't think with your family, if you come home and start behaving uh, differently, they'll look at you very strangely. And it's the same at work. You've got to be who you are. You, know, you cannot change that intrinsically. What you can be if you develop that skill and it really comes from a lot of courage is if you can develop uh, open ears. If somebody gives you negative feedback, encourage it. If somebody says you do this really badly, you should say, yes, I do. What do you, why do you think that is? You'll be so much happier firstly and you'll get so much feedback. It'll be a much better way. Rather than get defensive, somebody says you're doing this badly, you say, oh, the reason is that, you know, uh, I was trying to do that. But it's much better to say disarmingly, yes, I agree with you. And suddenly you find things uh, very different. And uh, perhaps you can use this example to illustrate also that uh, one can be successful with uh, very different leadership styles. I think this assumption that people have that every leader has to be a great communicator, every leader you know, has to be this alpha male type of character, uh, that's not true. I mean, people have very drastically different styles and can be highly successful with their core skills. <clears throat> I couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's what I was trying to imply, actually. I think you're exactly right. I think that... You need not be self-conscious in any way. One important thought I will, uh, I will put to you, which is that um, you have strengths and you have opportunities, right? All of us. Rather than to focus on the opportunities and fix them, focus on your strength. If you're naturally creative, seek a creative field. If you're naturally analytical, try to seek an analytical field. You'll be more comfortable with numbers and analysis than you are with intuitive judgments. Then don't get into marketing, and vice versa. You know, if you're intrinsically an intuitive person, uh, you should not be a CFO. You should really be in a creative sort of a field. So, have those conversations with people that know you best, and don't jump at the first opportunity. But you'll you'll find. You know, the question originally was, how do you choose a leadership style? And I would still go back to the original answer. Let it be the other way around. Let your leadership style choose you and embrace you for who you are. Uh, question here from Ayush Jain, who's an IIT Gandhi Nagar student. Uh, what makes a roadside tea or coffee shop into a cafe chain? <laughs> I think probably the owner. I mean, you know, all of them were that one time, if you talk to. <laughs> There's a great movie now on the McDonald's success. The McDonald's brothers actually were... Uh, running a very successful hamburger stand, but they did not build the McDonald's empire. That was Ray Kroc, he was a salesman for milkshakes and he came in there and he spotted the opportunity and he made it happen. You know, uh, same with Howard Schultz. He went to Spain, uh, if you read his biography, uh, he went and uh, he went to all the coffee shops in Spain and Italy and he said, hey, this is more a way of life than a coffee drinking place. People come here and discuss politics and read the newspaper. So he created this concept of a third place. And then he went to the, uh, you know, the original Starbucks and Pike Place in uh, Seattle, and he bought it and he made it into a gigantic success. So I guess the difference between a single shop and a big chain is, is a person who has the vision to make it great. Uh, fortunately, these days with social media and with so many tools available, the task I think has become actually easier. You do not have to have a big budget. You can just go on TikTok and you can have immediate <laughs> relevance to a lot of people. So if you have an idea that you think is replicable, yeah, you know, you can do it. Remember that it, it takes much more than running a roadside tea shop to build a chain. A chain calls for people, it calls for discipline, it calls for skill sets, it calls for central design and planning, calls for supply chains. Uh, and so I'll go back with the answer that, uh, you know, it a good individual can make it happen. So if you see a really good shop that you're very happy with, uh, you know, you can make it into a chain. Uh, Priyanshu Ranjan, uh, what role has networking played in your success and how do you leverage it? Yeah, 
Pleasure. I, I don't like that word. I tell you why. A lot of people come to me, young people particularly, and they say, hey, can you help me find a summer training or a job? And uh, the reason is I'm told that unless you network, there's no chance. I, I fundamentally disagree with that. I think all of us who you know, come out of IIT and been successful never had that networking. You know, we, I, we didn't know anybody. I mean, I did not know anybody in Hindustan. I certainly did not know anybody at uh, Reebok. And, uh, uh, you know, you should do your work well. And uh, the network is not something that is an artificial construct that you develop. A network is developed automatically through your work. If you're known as a good worker in whatever field you are in, people in that field or in your company will get interested and they'll come looking for you. So just focus on what you're doing and do it really well. Don't worry about where it'll lead you and you'll go much further than if you're focused on the next job. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. Uh, here's a question from Kanishk Kalra. I went vegan recently and since you are working with Beyond Meat, what is your assessment of the future of the vegan food in this industry, especially in a country like India, as it is still very expensive and the supply is still small? Well, uh, congratulations on turning a vegan. Uh, Ethan Brown is a vegan as well. He's the founder of Beyond Meat, and a lot of his team members are as well. Uh, he's done it for ethical reasons, and I'm sure you, that plays a role in your determination also. He, uh, Ethan Brown grew up in a farm where they were milking cows, and he did not like that, the way they were, cows were impregnated just for giving milk, and then they were, the way they were treated and separated from their calves and all of that stuff. He didn't like it, and so he rebelled against any form of animal exploitation in the production of food. I think that companies like Beyond Meat and then many others uh, you probably have heard of are all starting up because I mean they're getting tremendous reception from consumers for this reason. Uh, I can tell you that for Beyond Meat and a number of other companies in this field, uh, it's not vegans who are the first customer. The first customers are what are called flexitarians. These are people who eat meat, but they want to cut down on meat consumption. They don't like eating meat so regularly. So there's this concept in many countries of meatless Mondays, you know, start the week well, don't eat meat on a Monday. And now with Beyond Meat and companies like that, you have the ability to eat any kind of taste, any kind of product with no uh, completely vegan offering. There's no GMO, there's no uh, antibiotics, there's no milk, there's no animal products whatsoever. It's just made from plant protein. I think just like electric cars, this is just the start of the revolution. At the moment, you're right, the pricing is high because the market is relatively small, but fundamentally, there is no reason why plant-based meat should not be cheaper than meat because animals produce a lot of byproducts and all the bone and the cartilage and all the waste, which is unnecessary. You can go straight to the plants, get those proteins, assemble them and make them in the same way. So um, hang on, you know, I applaud you. And I, one of my best friends actually is a Jain. Uh, Vinay Jain, he's a doctor here, he's a great guy, and he, I, I get very impressed every time I spoke with him, speak with him. And he encouraged me to take this assignment and said, hey, this is the greatest service you can provide, you know, in your career. Now that you've done all this, if you can stop animal abuse, that'll be a big contribution. So I, I applaud you. Hey, uh, we'll take a couple of quick questions. Uh, one from here from Mayank Khevaria. Can you highlight a few points or habits or practices on how you develop a team in which you are not continuously telling them what to do or having to follow up with them that they become responsible for their work and hopefully become leaders themselves? Yeah, Mike, there's a model which uh, you know, I learned early on in my career. It's a very good model. And it says that there are three ways of operating with a team and two of them do not work. The first one is called tell, where you tell people what to do and it doesn't work. I mean, even if you, when you, when you have a child, you know, a little child and uh, you extend your hand to them, uh, you know, they will slap your hand. <laughs> they don't want your hand. They want to walk on their own. Nobody likes to be told what to do. So tell is not a good way to work. The second mode is called sell. Sell is where you try to give the benefits. You know, if you do this, you will get this bonus. If you do this, you'll get the reward. If you do this, and this is the reason for it. It doesn't work either. In fact, sometimes tell is better than sell because people recoil from that sort of thing as well. The model that really works is called solve, solve. Don't tell, don't sell, solve. Identify the problem and solve it together. So if you're with a team, rather than you know, standing up at the start, 
the, the key is to identify what you are trying to achieve. What is the goal that you are trying to achieve? And try to solve that problem together. And I think if you broadly follow that, you'll be very successful. Remember that you should not be afraid of being displaced as the leader. Sometimes you may have that fear that, hey, I'm not leading. I should be strong. I should be standing up. They should all be following me. Not at all. Not at all. In fact, if you can lead from behind and you can be the facility, you're already the leader. You're the appointed leader of that team. The company is giving you that power and the title. You don't have to emphasize it. The more you uh, emphasize it, the less successful you will be. The less you emphasize it, the more likely your team will respond well to you. So focus on the goal. Try to get that done. Don't worry about the dynamics so much, you know. The best person in the team, let them take the lead. We will take this last question from Bhukia Hiram Nayak. Uh, how do you sustain your start startup and expand your products in the early years of rejection uh, in amongst the brands that are already ruling uh, and controlling a major share of the market? Any thought, suggestions on that? Yeah, I think it, uh, okay, it comes back to innovation. You should be sufficiently different. I mean, I'm seeing with Beyond Meat, for example, there are gigantic meat companies in this world, the gigantic food companies. If you take, you know, Kraft and Unilever and Nestle and, you know, Tyson, these are like $100 billion market cap companies with tremendous resources. They can do this, but it's the way of the world. They will not do it because they're afraid to innovate. Uh, the reason why General Motors could not do an electric car and that Tesla today is worth 10 times General Motors is because they did it differently. They did not produce the normal car, they did it differently. Now, as I said at the start, when you do things differently, the world is your enemy. And uh, uh, really you need a lot of courage, but you have to be brutally honest with yourself is that what you are doing, is it sufficiently different from what is already there in the market? Because if it is not, then the people who are already there have got more resources, more people, more financial capability, better distribution, more supply chain, you have no chance of success. But there's always a better way of doing it. So if you're making meat without killing animals, that is different. If you're making cars without using a uh, petrol, that is very different. And uh, that's what uh, these people did. And that's what makes for success. So I guess the key is to sit back and really ask yourself if your thing is sufficiently different. Now, if it is different and you're still struggling, you just line up the finance for it. You know, just get the, the key is people, entrepreneurs don't run out of energy, they run out of money. You know, within two or three years, when you're staring and the bank is knocking at your door and people are possessing your house, that's a real crunch. And you've got to line up the liquidity to be able to meet your ambition. And of course, beyond a point, if it's not working, uh, it's too bad. You've got to either sell out or, or close it down. But I would go back to the first point. Make sure that you are differentiated. Thank you, Mickey. And we hope you will join us on the next Leadership Chat. Thank you. <laughs>